think that people are getting on a plane and going overseas um, to have sex with young children, but the number one place for a predator to go is their own country. Generally, the pimps take their money and they are beat when they don't perform um, their quota. We actually saw places where girls were locked in hotel rooms. There were bars on the windows and they were not allowed to leave at all. worth any amount for them to have a fresh start to, to recognize that they get the opportunity to do something different and that God wants to do great things with them. Welcome to Pure Passion. I'm David. And I'm Amy. And we're your hosts for today's program. Did you know that there are over 200,000 victims of sex trafficking in the United States alone? We tend to see this as an overseas problem, but the United States is fast becoming one of the largest countries for sex trafficking activity in the world. And no wonder, because to a large extent, it has been U.S. men who have been the largest users of trafficked girls and boys throughout the world. Today, we're gonna to hear from Stasia Freeman, director of the Home Foundation in Nashville, Tennessee, a ministry that was founded by Christian singing artist, Natalie Grant, for the purpose of helping U.S. victims of sex trafficking. Stasia is going to co-host programs on Pure Passion this year that focus on sex trafficking and related issues. So you'll be seeing more of her as the season progresses. But today, Stasia is going to share with us what she has learned in her work with the Home Foundation about sex trafficking in the United States and what U.S. citizens can do to make it stop. She'll also be informing us about how to participate in the rescue and rehabilitation of those who are being victimized by this horrid trade. Sex trafficking is one of the most horrific crimes ever devised by the mind of man, and it is vital that we give this matter our focused attention. And then ask the Lord what He would have us do. We have 100,000 to 300,000 trafficking victims here um, domestically per year. There's about 17,000 that are trafficked into our country for the purpose of sexual exploitation from other countries. And then somewhere around 200,000 that are trafficked within our country. You think that people are getting on a plane and going overseas um, to have sex with young children, but the number one place for a predator to go is their own country. So they're not waiting and going once a year and fulfilling that need overseas. They're actually um, exploiting children here domestically as well. A lot of the um, places that are centrally located, especially because of the interstate system, um, are, are huge hubs for trafficking activity. And um, many of the girls are actually taken from outside locations and trafficked into those regions because of the trucking industries. Well, a lot of them are runaways, and they, they come from broken homes where they don't have a parent that's maybe looking out for them. Um, th like, within 48 hours after a girl runs away, she's approached by a pimp, um, offering her the opportunity to be sold for sex. And um, unfortunately, many of these girls have a skewed concept of what love actually is, and the traffickers can be so wise in the way that they trick them into believing that it's just a job, it's just something that they do, that a lot of times the girls start to separate them, their selves and their worth from the job that they do, and they actually kind of fall into the trap of serving that person that they believe cares for them. A lot of them are led to believe that they're going to work um, domestic, you know, house cleaning, work in a restaurant. We recently read a case um, where some girls were trafficked into our country from another country, believing that they were going to work in resorts, and then they were tricked into dancing, and the strip club was a front for trafficking activity where they were actually sold for sex. Um, so a lot of times it's a web of lies that get them to the point um, where they're, they're actually prostituted out. A lot of times they're told that we know where your family is, we'll, you know, we'll kill your family, we'll, we'll hurt you or your friend or your little sister, or, and, then, and then their self-worth is um, defined by what they've done, and so nobody wants you, you're not valuable. Um, in the case where they're a runaway, a lot of them believe that anything's better than what, whatever they left. Many of the girls are actually um, abused in their own homes, so they're leaving a bad situation and, and end up in a worse situation. It is true that um, many of the girls are, are, are treated um, as criminals instead of as victims. And so when they're picked up, um, they're 
booked for prostitution, and that's a real problem in our law enforcement, that we really don't know how to, to treat the girls that are brought in. The ones that are sent into our country from overseas are oftentimes afraid that they'll be deported. Um, they're led to believe that the people that are pretending to rescue you are just pretending, and they don't really have your best interests at heart. And so in a sense, they believe that the situation they're in is just kind of their lot in life, that there is no escape. So fear is really the catalyst for why they, they won't try to run away. I think the daily life, what goes on, uh, depends on different circumstances. Um, I, I worked with one girl um, a few years ago who said that during the day they were not allowed to be in the house where they dressed or got ready to go out at night. So they would basically wander the streets, sleep on park benches, um, hang out at coffee houses or places where people might be inclined to give them handouts. Um, so I think it, it varies. A lot of them might go to drop-in centers um, to try to, you know, get a meal or just kill time, basically. So it depends from city to city how they actually, and how closely they're watched in terms of how, how, how much freedom they have. This particular case that I worked with told me that she was required to report to her pimp at a specific location every night at 5.30, every afternoon at 5.30. And they would spend about an hour getting ready to go out on the street or to go work a hotel or wherever they were working for that night. And um, they, would go, they would be sent out on the street around 6.30 to 7 o'clock, or depending on when it, was, when it got dark. And then they were to report back in the next morning at 5.00 to turn in their money and things like that. So I've heard various different accounts of, you know, what is expected of them. But I know that generally the pimps take their money and they are beat when they don't perform um, their quota, what's expected of them. I visited Istanbul, Turkey, where we actually saw places where girls were locked in hotel rooms. There were bars on the windows and they were not allowed to leave at all, ever. And um, they, basically brought their clients to the room and they serviced the men and then they took them out. Um, I, the, the cases that I've read here domestically, and I know there are a lot of them, but the cases, many of the cases that I've read have been that, that they travel in small groups. Um, they may service a different area, um, especially if there's a sporting event or some major event happening, and then they move ra rather quickly. The whole idea domestically is they don't want to keep girls in one location for long periods of time because they don't want them to establish roots in a community. So they move them every four to six weeks so that they never really feel safe or never feel a sense of community so that they don't run. They don't, they, they don't feel apart enough to reach out to people or believe that people would help them. One thing that I was recently told was that back in the 80s when all the organized crime was doing drug trafficking that every one of those organized crime or those organizations are actually trafficking people now because they've, they've, they've recognized that it's a lot more profitable. So I would say it's probably higher than we even know. Um, I was working with a security person recently who said to me, when you're working um, with just an average pimp that's trafficking girls to support his drug habit, um, most of them are, they can't, they couldn't shoot the side of a barn with a gun. So the level of security is much different than when you actually are working organized crime. And he said the problem is, is that organized crime is entering into this more and more. The traffickers are not um, stupid people. They're very smart in figuring out how to control their empire. And what it's really based on, obviously, is a lie. So it's based on um, trust. And so they have to get the girls to trust them. And a lot of times I think what they've realized is that the girls are going to trust a woman more readily than maybe they would trust a man. And many times, um, a girl that has been trafficked starts to recognize that one of the only ways for her to survive is to actually become part of the process. And so in a sense, they work their way up the ladder and they become a trafficker themselves. And maybe it's a girl internationally that's from a, a certain village and she goes back to this village um, that's very poor and she's dressed in clothes that are nice and she has the latest gadgets and she looks 
happy and maybe even wealthy. And so the girls in this poor region want what she has, and she convinces them that they can come with her. And in many times, um, maybe tells them that she achieved her status by working in retail or um, and, and a lot of times what here domestically we may think doesn't sound like a lot of a lot of money in some of the poor regions of the world um, it, it sounds like a lot of money to them because they're living on relatively little income and they're used to, to doing without so it's very attractive to them so we don't need to underestimate their their ability to traffic people to trick them or their um, desire to, to maintain and to grow their empire. Well, I don't know how the men justify um, exploiting, especially a small girl, a, a little bitty girl, or anybody for that matter. Um, I, I think that it's a mindset of worth. And I would say that from, a, from my perspective, in terms of my beliefs, it goes deep into how they feel about themselves. Because if you don't value yourself, um, then maybe it's easy not to value other people as well. I recently was reading something about a college, a group of college kids that went on, went overseas and thought it would be cool to go and, you know, buy a prostitute. And when the boy got upstairs, uh, he, this girl was attractive. He was surprised. It wasn't what he expected. And when he started talking to her, he realized she was, had been a college student and had been tricked and um, believed that she was coming to the city to do some other kind of work. And he was amazed that this wasn't just some girl that actually chose this, that it basically chose her. And she didn't have a lot of um, opportunity to say no. Uh, so I think in some cases, um, there are people that just don't recognize what it really is, and they assume that a person chose that lifestyle. I don't know how someone could look at a five- or six-year-old in places like Cambodia or Thailand and assume that um, it, w it would be okay. Here, domestically, the average age is 12 to 13. I find it hard to believe that someone would think that a 12-year-old would have the, the wherewithal about them to actually make an informed decision about offering themselves for sex. Is it possible for a child sexual molester to be healed enough to be safe around children? I once asked Leanne Payne if she had ever known a child molester to be healed, and she replied, oh my lands, yes honey, lots of them. Though the statistics aren't very assuring for this population, which has a higher rate of recidivism than most, God can do anything. So of course it's possible. The better question is, considering our inability to see into a person's heart, to know with a certainty that they are now safe with children, is it wise? The answer for the alcoholic is obvious to everyone when the question arises whether they should be around alcohol anymore. And I think it should be in this case as well. Despite the fact that God can transform our affections, there always remains a vulnerability to the sin that easily besets us, which requires us to stay away from the object of temptation, whether it be alcohol, romance novels, credit cards, suggestive films, or the kind of person who can trigger immoral desire. If we are to remain healed, we must keep within the bounds Christ places around us. He knows that there are going to be moments in our life where we become discouraged, disappointed, and angry at Him, defeated and depressed. In such moments, we are vulnerable again to the old ways of thinking and acting. It's much more difficult to resist the thought of eating a piece of cake when you have a luscious piece sitting in front of your eyes. That's why God exhorts us in His Word to guard our heart and mind, to set no evil thing before our eyes. Whatever sins have given us pleasure in the past, outside of God's shelter, we all become vulnerable to them again, especially when things aren't going well in our lives. With a former child molester, the consequences of a fall are too grave to take that chance. Asking that they not be alone in the presence of children again is a prudent requirement for the sake of the children. It's not a question of God not being able to do the healing perfectly or completely, but rather a matter of man not being able to know with a certainty that someone has been fully healed. We also have to be honest about the fact that even with the best of intentions, 
we do not always remain faithful to what God has done in us, nor do we perfectly appropriate all of the healing that is there for us. We all remain imperfect until Jesus comes again, child molester or no. The Home Foundation was started in 2005 by Natalie Grant, who's a Christian singer, songwriter, and she found out about trafficking, much like many of us find out about it, um, just watching TV, and they did a show on trafficking in New York City, and she, kind of like me, thought, this could not be happening. You're kidding me. You know, they're selling people out of a van in New York City like they sell fake handbags. And so she started doing research, ended up going on a mission trip to Mumbai, and really decided that she would devote her career and her platform to speaking out against sex trafficking. Um, we primarily were started to do international work, really to raise awareness on what was going on internationally, pretty oblivious to the fact that it was happening here. And so we were working in India, in Moldova, we've partnered in Greece with the A21 campaign. And um, about two years ago came face to face with domestic trafficking. And we were blown away that when we had a girl that needed a place to go, there were very limited places to put her. First of all, places that specialized in um, reaching out to girls that had been exploited sexually and understanding the uniqueness of their needs, but also um, places that were Christ-centered that could say to these girls, you're not defined by what has happened to you in the past. The, the God that created you, the God that loves you, still has a plan for your future, and it's separate from your past. And so we really decided that our mission would become restoration with an emphasis on Christ-centered restoration, and we would look first domestically. We continue the partnerships internationally in four countries, and um, we hope that eventually through an association for those that are dedicated to Christ-centered uh, restorations that will have a home in every major city because now what happens is when girls come forward or they're rescued or whatever the the scenario may be um, they're they're put in jail sometimes as long as they're perpetrators and because the law enforcement if they need them to testify they're so afraid that they'll run um, they, they keep them in jail until that they can testify so we know that that's no place for healing and so we hope that we'll have a facility in every major in every state in every major city so that girls can actually begin the healing process um, while they wait await the trial um, because many of them have to stay in the state where they were rescued they can't leave if they're minors, if they're facilities that are serving minors, they're doing schoolwork during the day, they're maybe going to Bible study, they're getting counseling every day, either group or individual counseling. They, they, do, um, they work with um, different opportunities that give them life skills. Um, and most of the facilities, the, the ideal would be that, for, that they would stay 18 to 24 months, but it varies from state to state in terms of how long they, they will allow you to keep them. One of the greatest things about some of the, the shelters overseas is that they will actually help them gain lawful employment so that they can actually support their families and will never have to return to the sex trade. Because many times if they're rescued but they're not given skills to, sur to support their families, they'll go back because they want to feed their children. And um, so overseas, it's really great when they can offer them other opportunities. Um, domestically, the domestic shelters try to look at what track are they on? Are they more on an educational track? Do they need, um, you know, technical skills um, so that they can get support with their education or support with their um, work, you know, different things, trade things that they can do so that they are able to go out and, and earn a living. Well, it's just way more expensive domestically than it is overseas. For example, um, we worked with a shelter um, in India, and and they they could do for 30 kids for like $40,000 a year, and here it would have been over a million dollars. Just the cost is so much more here. The licensure is different. Um, staffing requirements are different domestically. Um, just 
building in general, the startup costs. I'm, we're working with a facility in Ohio right now called Grace Haven, and the renovation costs, I, that aside, the just to start with staff training and get people on board is a half a million dollars to serve something like 10 girls. So there's just the, the requirements domestically are more stringent probably than they are in many cases internationally, and the cost in general is more. It's worth $100,000 per girl because it would be worth any amount for them to have a fresh start to, to recognize that they get the opportunity to do something different and that God wants to do great things with them. And I think sometimes they don't realize that there are people out there that want to invest in them. Um, it was amazing to me when I first came to this one of the girls that we worked with, uh, and we don't do a lot of victim intake, we actually really work more with shelters that are doing that work, but um, everything we did for her, she wanted to do something equally back because she was so used to people doing things for her with strings attached. And it was really cool for us to be able to say, you know, we're just doing this for you because we want to, because we believe in you. We believe that you have potential and that you have value just because you're a person that God created. Um, and I think seeing the transformation from a girl who comes out of the sex trade that can't make eye contact, that's afraid, that can't sleep at night, that um, is not trusting, to watch her transform into somebody that believes in herself and has self-worth and sees herself beyond what somebody um, else says about her, it would be worth any amount of money. I mean, even if you could only help one person, I would say it would be worth it. The work is hard and it's long and the people that work in the shelters, um, it's emotionally draining. I don't think people realize what an emotional toll it takes on you. So prayer is, is something that everyone can do. And then obviously, um, if you can give financially, it's a huge help um, for us to get shelters started. Um, and then in, in many cases, you can give of your time. I initially, when a girl is first coming out of the sex trade and beginning the restoration process, it's difficult to engage volunteers. But as they transition out of a restoration home and start looking at the aftercare portion, there's a lot of opportunity for church families to um, be mentors to these girls to kind of do life with them. And um, the other thing is for teachers and educators that have time, if you or have time to volunteer and can volunteer in a home home based program for because many of the girls are homeschooled and can help them with their education that's very valuable medical doctors as well yes just to, because most of the shelters have to have a full-time psychiatrist um, there's a need for counselors um, and there's a lot of need for collaboration um, because what we're learning is the counselors even the counselors that are counseling the weight of the information is so heavy a lot of times they need a lot of support around them as well in terms of just being able to handle what what they're being told. I would say to a girl in a hotel right now that's thinking that she doesn't matter and thinking maybe that her life is all about what the work that she's been forced to do, that there are people out there that care about you and most of all there's a God that sees you for what He designed you to be and that He has a plan and a purpose for you and that you matter and your self-worth is not defined by what you do or by what someone else told you that you were defined by. And I would encourage you to reach out to someone that could help you to call the national hotline if you're a domestic case for, for trafficking or, or your, the local police department or an organization that specifically helps girls or individuals who have been trafficked and let them help you um, get to a place where you would be safe. When a girl or boy is rescued from sex trafficking, they are deeply scarred and wounded, and it can take years for the restoration process to be fully complete. Isn't it wonderful that the Home Foundation and other Christian-based organizations have been willing to take them through that process, not only helping to see them restored to normalcy, but also introducing them to the one who died for them, Jesus Christ, the one who paid for their sins, who loves them dearly, and wants them to be seated at His table in His kingdom for all eternity. In our day, Jesus is calling the church to go out into the highways and the byways and to invite anyone who will come to his banquet. 
Let's reach out to those lost and deeply broken young ones and show them the love of Jesus. Let's be part of this wonderful rescue and restoration process. Until next week, I'm Amy. And I'm David for Pure Passion. Following you to where the light is. Got steps I'm taking.